I'm close to the subject because it happened to me. One of my uh, board members from uh, my ex-company called Sasha Hausman. I can say his name because I won in court. One night he uh, attacked me and I ended up in hospital and he ended up in a prison cell. Which is, anybody who's listening now about and is going through this, you need to grab the courage, grab some people that you love around you and go and denounce it. And you know, most of these attacks end in death. Straight Fire VR is underway. We have the vacation rental industry in our sights and we're ready to take aim. Joining us to tackle these complex topics are two guests who bring perspectives from two opposite sides of the world. First, we have California-based Don Yaskelski, founder and CEO of onboarding software platform PMS Pros. And joining us from Spain is a woman's leadership advocate and CEO at Sistonica, Vanessa de Souza Loge. As always, we have our co-host, regional director of business at Btrips, as well as the co-host of Straight Fire VR podcast, Miriam Ramsey. Opening the topic of conversation today is our host of our podcast, Steve Milo. Steve, go ahead and take aim. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Appreciate the intro. And I wanted to start off with another episode of Straight Fire VR. Um, and last uh, week, we met with Jason Sprinkle. Uh, he was not a lot of happy conversation regarding the U.S. market, Miriam. He was pretty glum. But, uh, He's a sad boy. <laughs> yeah, he, he definitely did not have uh, anything optimistic. So I'm curious, Vanessa, you're uh, more in Europe. What are you hearing from Europe in terms of 2024 this year? Uh, no, no, nothing, nothing bad as yet. Um, I mean, based on 2023, which was really good, um, people are kind of confident that it's going to continue. <laughs> So yeah, so um, it was interesting because Europe was definitely different than the U.S. market, um, and part of it is I think the currency exchange. You know, the um, U.S. dollar is a lot stronger against the European um, and obviously other uh, currencies worldwide, and so that's created a bit of an imbalance of travelers in and out. Uh, there's uh, the U.S. market has not recovered on international travel to post. Um, you know, from post-COVID numbers. So um, it is interesting that at least in Europe, uh, the STR market is still strong. Um, are you still seeing a lot of new supply going on? Because I know in Eastern Europe, there was a ton of new supply as well. Yeah, yeah, especially in markets where, you know, regulations are tough and we kind of see the latest ADNA reports. So like markets are growing in terms of product. And I thought, how is this possible when the laws are so tough? <laughs> um, yes, it looks like we're growing, absolutely. Growing and growing. I mean, Europe has always been, uh, you know, the number one market for us, for worldwide. So um, nothing bad happening here apart from, uh, you know, looming regulations. And uh, we need to pump a lot more money into, you know, the associations. Uh, everybody is getting more aware of that. It's more of a topic now uh, during conferences. But, um, but yeah, I see optimism all around, um, apart from cities. <laughs> Yeah. I think it's funny we brought up regulations twice because we're seeing it in both markets. So the European mm -hmm. market is seeing more regulations coming in with the SDR as well as, you know, the, the U.S., which mm -hmm. is kind of crazy that both are just booming. You know, it's a ton of income coming in, but it also getting regulated and everybody having an opinion on rentals or what you can do and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially in elections years, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's. Yeah, you take that front and, and use it. But but I think, you know, one, one of the things that we talk about a lot is that we're missing one uh, kind of uh, mission statement to say to the world, you know, why are short-term rentals and vacation rentals good uh, for the economy? Why are they good for um, guests? Why How many jobs we produce, et cetera? And we're missing that kind of one voice, um, yeah. You know, uh, and it would be great to have it. We're working on it um, across different countries in Europe, across different associations. We're working on that one powerful message. But what we're missing really is is funds. Uh, you know, the associations are struggling. And, you know, the lobbies of hotels, they're very, very powerful. So 
this is this is what we need to to fight for this year is that more people put more money uh into associations well i'm, I'm curious vanessa um do you have any organization like vrma in the united states that kind of is organizing everybody together because i know there's some really concerning things happening in portugal and mm -hmm. you know you would think that that would bring everybody together yeah so we have an eu uh, eu level uh, association uh, but it, it's it's struggling i mean with funds you know uh, and then uh, you know take spain for example where you have lots of small associations um you have one spanish one and it's trying to regroup all of these small associations but it's very hard because in spain for example in every different community they make their own rules around under short mentors. So we do need on the local level, we need on the national level, and we also need on the EU level. And this is where, you know, it's very confusing. Um, and it's very confusing to get one message out. And they need to liaise way more with each other and support each other. Um, but all of this, uh, as I said, you know, is, is just lacking funds, plainly lacking funds. All right, well, the reason why I wanted to have you, and, and we're now joined by Don uh, as well, is uh, we wanted to kind of catch up on some of the latest events in the news. And um, Vanessa, I want to start off, I don't know if you read the article on Sonder uh, laying off 17% of their corporate staff, but um, things aren't looking good there. Their uh, market cap is like $20 million. Do you have much Sonder presence in Europe? Mm, I mean, I'm, I I know Sonder. Um, we don't have as much as the US, that's for sure. But they have um, started to to come into Europe. We have some buildings in Barcelona and Madrid, for example, in Spain. And I'm not aware of the other locations really. Um, very hard for. Uh, for companies to cross the pond, as you know, uh, it's it's really hard, and especially you know, Europe is a complicated market with different languages, uh, different rules, different regulations. Um, it's very hard, very hard to for American companies to come over. I don't know how they're doing in Europe, really plainly. I have no idea. So, John, were were you familiar with Sonder? Because I know they raised a ton of money from private equity companies who seemingly pushed them into this grow revenue at all costs and take on um, all kinds of crazy liabilities. They, they're they a lease arbitrage model, which means effect, effectively they would take all the risk, right? So unlike a traditional property management company where we're an agency and we make money um, if the owner makes money, but we don't lose money because we don't, we're not, uh, we're not into a guaranteed payment. Um, I, I'm sure you were kind of shocked because they raised well over a billion dollars and it, it doesn't look like they're going to survive this year. You know, it, it's such a risky model that you really have to be stable in order to, to make that model work for you. I'm really surprised, given the, um, the state of the vacation rental industry as a whole, that that model was still something that was being considered. So... I'm not surprised by it. Um, it. It's just, I don't think it was the right time. Well, another company that uh, looks like they're uh, on their last leg, so to speak, is Front Desk. Were you familiar with them? Because I know, again, they were another company that raised a lot of people. According to Skift, they laid off their entire 200-person workforce uh, in an attempt to you know, reduce cash flow, which doesn't sound optimistic for them to continue. Um, I believe Jesse DePento was uh, the CEO of that company, but another company that raised money basically to do leaseback arbitrage model. You know, front desk is not something that we um, came across here um, competing with major PMSs or competing against in any way. So it's, it's not, I don't think it's very impactful, at least for us, but it is a, a strong reminder that companies that do have that type of backing, you know, it's all about EBITDA and all decisions are, are controlled by that. So it's, 
survival of the fittest, I guess, when it comes to that. And you have to satisfy the investors. And that's a number one. Well, I think, Vanessa, this is interesting because I'll be curious for Europe. So in the U.S. market, we went through this massive capital phase within the vacation rental industry. And it really started primarily with Airbnb getting um, the level of funding they did. Um, they 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 were able to raise billions of dollars before they ultimately IPO'd. And then there was almost like a gold rush, right? So there was a gold rush of who was going to be the next Airbnb, who was going to be um, effectively the property management company or companies with an S, who was going to be effectively the picks and shovels, you know, the stores, uh, the property management systems. And so you had a flood of capital that came into uh, the market in, in Europe and, and for sure, Guesty is a good example. Um, we have uh, uh, Hostaway, another one that that received a huge amount of funding and others. But then in the U.S. market, we saw um, basically at the end of 2022, um, a fundamental reset in the capital markets. And that was driven in part uh, by the interest rate hikes uh, in the U.S. market uh, to combat inflation interest rates were driven up by five points, which really meant that it was very, very difficult now to raise money through debt. And then even with equity, the equity premium was much higher. So the, um, and that also caused some of these companies to have really severe um, cash flow situations. And, and we've seen PE firms lose their appetite for funding drastic burn rates. So is that happening in Europe? Is there a real um, focus now on profitability and EBITDA, or is it a little bit different than the U.S. market? I would say so. I would say we've been more advanced in that sense um, and more careful uh, in Europe. There's you know less investments and less quick investments than there were in, in the U.S. anyway. Um, but we see consolidation consol consolidation in the in the tech tech market uh, also in Europe. Uh, lots of smaller companies being bought up and the same with property management companies because now you know professional property management companies now have maybe they have 10 years 15 years of business right before that you couldn't call them professional but in the last 10 years this is all uh, very much more professional and so these companies that now basically mature um, small medium-sized companies are being bought um, but whether we're going to see, I mean, we have a few very large companies in Europe, you know, Sykes, Holiday Cottages, which continues to buy up companies, Aways, which has bought quite a few, and Interhome, uh, which doesn't seem to be on the spending spree, but, um, you know, is doing, is doing well. Uh, and the, you know, this, we have this this gap. So you go from, 20,000 properties, which is the third of the largest, to um, two, two and a half thousand properties. You know? And in between that, there's not much. Um, but these, two, these guys that have two and a half thousand properties, they, you know, they tend to, 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 to buy. And we've seen quite a few, um, quite a few acquisitions uh, last year by these companies. And they don't come out in the news so much we're uh, we're more shy about that <laughs> we just buy you know hyper local um and and don't talk so much about it but yes you know the, the, the companies are growing and they seem to be and they seem to do it with their own money which is nice <laughs> you know <laughs> well, we had graham uh donahy from sykes on um mm -hmm. last year and you know certainly they've been one of the role models for growing uh, with an EBITDA centric model, uh, mm -hmm. very, very diligent um, for sure. Um, Don, I kind of wanted to touch on uh, the vendor side first because we just talked about about you know the woes with property management companies like Sonder and Front Desk and other property management companies that effectively were operating to drive revenue but not with a focus of EBITDA, and and that doesn't seem to be a sustainable model. You're going to have to focus on EBITDA, but now. We also now see the vendor side affected by this because, um, at least in the U.S. market, as revenue has dropped, occupied nights has dropped. Um, that means spending among um, property managers is also dropping, which is creating um, cash flow 
um, and budget misses for some of these property management companies. Um, and they seemingly are le are more reluctant, at least they're the investors are more reluctant to um, fund large burn rates. Um, is that what you're seeing? Because I know you've been talking to a lot of technology companies in your new role. Um, and and what are you hearing? I'm hearing exactly what you just explained. It's It's a domino effect. So when... Unfortunately, when that spending comes to a halt and now the revenue dips for the technology company, they have to pull back the brakes and look for, for cost cutting uh, measures internally. And, you know, you, you, it always seems to go to the areas that are not revenue producing, unfortunately, uh, but that comes with a cost as well. So if you're looking to cut headcount and that headcount is in areas of client success or support, that in itself, even though those are not revenue producing areas of, of the business, they're vitally essential for, for the business to continue. So it's just when, when that funding gets pulled back or, or slows um, and the spending has to slow as well, you know, those are the areas that the companies typically look for is where can we make those cuts where seemingly it's not going to be as detrimental, but in, in effect, it, it really is. So, and I've seen this happen now quite a few times um, for various companies within our industry. Well, 2024 is going to be a tricky year to navigate for property management companies and obviously as we move into 2025 as well, because in some cases, some companies may be realizing they're on the wrong property management system. And why, what I mean by that is if they're on a property management system where um, the company has run out of funding or is low on funding and can't do product development or worse is cutting uh, client success managers, um, you could effectively be in a bad situation. We've, heard rumors of companies in the U.S. market that are wholesaling, cutting um, staff. Um, uh, we know, obviously, V12 from HomeAway, you know, literally sunset their product. Um, uh, Vanessa just alluded to uh, the Europe market, um, although Guesty seems to still be on a, a bit of a buying spree. Um, but some of the smaller companies have definitely run into some trouble. Um so Vanessa, are you, are you seeing this consolidation? Are you seeing that in Europe with the property management systems and property managers kind of scrambling to figure out which system they need to be on? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's uh, I think it, this is a global problem, <laughs> which PMS to use. Um, and I think it's clear now to everyone that uh, no PMS is perfect. Uh, but obviously, you want to uh, keep it as long as possible since um, since you're investing so much time and effort to choose uh, and to move all your product onto it. But I also think that people are less and less uh, worried about changing PMS because PMS have made the effort <laughs> of uh, of you know the onboarding being very you know much much better, much faster. You convince people that you know in two months you're going to be there. Um, we're going to do a bit by bit and overnight, boom, you know, it's all going to be great. And so people, are, I, um, you know, I've met property managers, they've been three years in business and they've changed five times PMSs, you know. So um, so it's not such a, it sounds like a very, very big deal. Uh, and it, in fact, it is because it is work. But uh, but but people are less afraid now to change. And that's, uh, and that's, uh, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing because if it doesn't work for you, then you need to change. <laughs> no. Well, Don, uh, I'm sure you're going to say it's easy to switch from one PMS to another. Uh, however, a company the size of VTrips found out the hard way it's not so simple. So maybe uh, give your thoughts on that because um, it's taken us since we launched from V12 to track. It's probably taken us two plus years to get back to where we were. I mean, it's just a pretty massive lift, um, even with the resources VTrips has to um, to get yourself back to where you have everything working because of the myriad of APIs, all the database issues, uh, but maybe you've you've seen an, a, a better way. 
Well, that's because you're a dinosaur, Steve. <laughs> You've been at it for too long. <laughs> the young, the younger property managers, you know, they, uh, they, they have a much easier, easier, easier way because they started off with uh, something that was, um, well, pretty much modern, <laughs> as opposed to something that's very old-fashioned. So he just called uh, you old, yeah. and I love it. That's right. <laughs> Well, well, John, no, I what, consider myself a dinosaur too, don't worry. <laughs> well, well, but Don, I, I know in the U.S. market, we have a little bit different situation with trust accounting in a lot of the states than Europe, which uh, European yeah. property management system is a little easier because uh, companies have their own accounting system, but it can be a huge lift. Um, and even having the trust accounting work right is, can be a big problem. Absolutely. Um, there are, and there's varying degrees of, of trust accounting. So a, a company could have basic trust accounting, a PMS. However, there are, there's different layers to that. So for example, uh, New Jersey, um, South Jersey, huge Jersey Shore area, huge um, market. They um, have a model, which 99% of all the property managers go by, where they will accept multiple payments, uh, three, four, five payments coming in um, towards a reservation six months out. Um, upon receiving every single one of those payments, they disperse to the owners. So that takes, you know, North Carolina dispensing or dispersing to their owners a small portion of it. We thought that was kind of um, kind of risky. Um, that area of New Jersey takes it even further. So depending on the PMS, you have to be able to adjust to all the different nuances of not just do you do trust accounting or don't you, but all the different things you do do in the certain um, types of trust accounting, depending on the, the state and the location. So it's it's difficult. It, it really is. And you said it, Steve, it's migrating a PMS, at least over here, Vanessa, um, it is, people would rather stick hot pokers in their eyes before going through a PMS conversion. And rightfully so, it, it, it upheaves your business. Um, it requires so much effort and so much, and your staff still has to do their job. So you're saying, okay, besides doing your job, we are now going to take on migrating this PMS, which is going to consist of X, Y, Z over three months, where in actuality, it's more like six months, or in Steve's case, two years. Uh, and it only, that that's for a basic migration. If you take someone like Steve that has multiple locations, that requires each location to really operate um, on its own with its own functionality, then that just adds into the the complexity even more so that is what i'm now trying to facilitate um, through my new business is giving that outside assistance for pms for property managers that do want to uh, switch pmss but it is one of the reasons why i think we're starting to see consolidation in the pms side is because at least on the us side to do the trust accounting right just requires a massive amount of development and then um, client support. And then just the complexity of the APIs, if you're using your PMS system to, to open up the APIs for distribution, uh, for revenue management, for operational items like service um, or housekeeping or things like that, um, not to mention smart locks, all the components that tie in. If you're trying to tie that all through one PMS system. There's just a ton of APIs that can break down. So it is really, really complicated. But we'll talk about another area where there's opportunity, and that would be, I would consider, some of the niches here. And, you know, Vanessa, you have um, founded a company, Sustanica, which is about sustainable, um, you know, sustainable business or business practices in the vacation rental industry. And um, I, I kind of am curious because there's been so much in the, at least in Europe and U S about climate change and the fact that you can actually, in some cases, save money by 
going green or being smarter. And, you know, one of the things you and I talked about a while ago was laundry facilities. You know, when I first started, you know, there were still people and, and that still happens with rent by owners who were cleaning um, units, like they were cleaning laundry in units. And that's a very, very inefficient, energy inefficient way of processing laundry, not to mention um, the use of water. Whereas now if you have modern laundry facilities, they're using recycled uh, water, uh, you're you're managing a huge amount of laundry on a scale. Um, there's just efficiency. Um, and, and not only that, then you're saving on, you know, your washer and dryer in a unit. Um, but I mean, that's just one of many, many areas, I'm sure, chemicals, all those other things that you can talk about. But what are you finding and, and how are things going um, with your company? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Steve. So first of all, it's not a niche. Um, consumers are changing uh, across the globe. Uh, everybody is more aware of their footprint, of what we consume, of single-use plastic, of water consumption, energy consumption, because of the news, in fact. So consumers in general are changing, and especially led by the younger generations, the Gen Zs, as you call them in the, in the States. All right, for them, sustainability is top value. Uh, they want to spend their dollar with companies that uh, are aware of their footprint, that do stuff for the environment, that are, have diversity policies, inclusion policies, etc. So it's not a niche, it's a consumer trend. And what, what we do is that we help property managers and owners to, um, to follow a standard to make their properties more respectful of the environment and the community. So it's not just environment. It's also social. So it's kind of a, a blueprint, like, uh, you know, these are the things I need to tick off in my property in order for it to be uh, to consume less. And then by doing this, we kind of remove this overconsumption possibility from the guest, right, which is where the, the savings come in. So the guest, as you know, you know, this is the worst time you can you want to educate someone is on holiday, on vacation. You don't want to hear about anything. You don't, you know, just want to put your feet up, uh, leave the window open and the air con on. You don't care. Uh, and so here we come by making homes that, you know, make sure that even if you were to do this, there will be mechanisms in place to uh, to stop you from burning and over consuming. For example, uh, smart occupancy sensor, right, which is part of our criteria. You, you guys know what that is? It's like a, a sensor that turns off the aircon and the heating when the guest disappears from the home for at least half an hour. Um, and you make huge amounts of saving with that. I use it myself in my own property in Barcelona, and I save 30% of my, of my uh, energy consumption with it. Um, tricks like these that kind of help uh, help you, you know, with your bills and at the same time remove the possibilities of over-consuming. And this touches on energy, on water, on what we can do with waste. So things like leaving shampoo and shower gel that is free of microplastics. Do not ever give these away. You know, the small single-use shampoo bottles, this is completely out of fashion, prone to bad reviews. Um, so we don't leave those anymore. We leave refillable dispensers. Yes, it's maintenance. It's a maintenance job. If you have the same amount of properties as you, uh, Steve, then, uh, you know, it's, it's a job. Uh, it's got to be done. But then you also clean your aircon filters, right? Which cost you, I don't know how many millions of dollars a, uh, a year, right? Uh, so it's this part of, of, of kind of the new maintenance of a, of a property management company is installing these things that um, that made the property greener, as such. So, so and for Mary, that we give you a badge. <laughs> and if Mary, you do it, we give you a badge so you can show it off on Booking.com and appear in Travel Sustainable Level Three Plus. <laughs> uh, we're not getting badges. You what? You don't want a we're badge? We're not going to get a badge. Yeah, we we give the little bottles. Oh, what? Well, stop! You're going to get bad reviews. I'm telling you. I was booking a flight a few days ago and I normally always book domestic, but I was booking Lufthansa and I was surprised that when I was going through it, every single flight had a rating as to how carbon neutral it was. And, and it was, they, they varied considerably, mm -hmm. I guess, depending on the plane, but that mm -hmm. just gives another example as to how Europe might be a little bit more progressive in that area than the U S or make their, their customers aware. My market in Tennessee, 
that is going look it will it get there possibly but i think that's going to be a more of a five ten year down the road whereas mm -hmm. other markets being more you know friendly on like like going green and stuff so we'll see i think i mean it, like i love the fact of having the refillable bottles and doing that kind of stuff i think it's more of a luxury but in my market it's not going to be a bad review on having the little bottles of shampoo right for some individuals coming possibly but as a whole it's not going to really impact that so Whereas, about, uh, for, for your conscience know. how about for your conscience <laughs> you know that these, I mean, these little bottles you throw them away and they stay for hundreds of years in the landfill is that okay right. you know, it's not okay why if you can remedy it by a very simple which in fact costs less the refillables cost less oh. full stop um, so, you know, why, if, if you can do something for the planet, for, for the next generations, even if you don't believe that, you know, the, that the crisis that we're going through at the moment is man-made, even if you're on that side of the spectrum, you want to pollute less, right? I mean, this is kind no, of, everybody you does. know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, one thing my... in the U.S. market that's been helpful <laughs> is the hotels have been leading the way um, going towards more of these uh, larger bottles and, and getting away from the small uh, size. So, you know, I applaud the hotel industry. I think Marriott really started it and Hilton Hyatt and the other large brands have followed. And and now it's more the norm when when I've gone into a hotel that they – um, have pumps um, within the bathroom, uh, either they're installed or they're um, sitting on the bathtub or the, the 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 banister. But you know, one way or another, I think that's been helpful in terms of getting consumers used to this and and it not being then seen as a way for property managers or for vacation rentals to be quote unquote cheap. So I think we owe the hotels a you know a, a round of applause for leading the way logistically we've got to figure out how to do it we've we've talked internally about it it's been something that's been an initiative of mine because i think um it does two things one obviously it helps the environment and two it should save money uh yeah. it is extremely wasteful as vanessa said to have those little bottles i mean that there's no question about that that is a bad uh model for for all and it's it's costly so Hopefully we'll figure it out because um, it's something I've I've wanted to do, and we we may just have to pick a couple test markets, and maybe uh, Gatlinburg will be one of them. So there you go. Mary. Exactly. There we go. Good That's stuff. why I'm going to look at that stuff tomorrow. So to see to get the calls, get breakdowns, you know, and see what we can do with it. So I also wanted to have um, the three of you on. Also, there was some news in January, uh, and I know um, you know Vanessa's made some comments publicly about it regarding a company, um, Casago, who had uh, a woman alleging, uh, well, she had a domestic assault and she was alleging one of the um, partners over Casago um, assaulted her. And, and it became something where a lot of us were getting direct messages, um, but the, uh, the victim, was not able to get her story out. Uh, her concern was um, the person who did this to her, the perpetrator, was still um, was not was still not on leave. He was he was working for the company. This this happened in October. She had tried a couple different ways of getting this escalated um, to the leadership over at Casago. Um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests um, the leadership at Casago knew about this and just chose not to place this person on leave. And uh, finally, um, uh, you know, it, it got to a point that I published something on LinkedIn. And then uh, a couple of days later, the, the person who's accused of um, assaulting this victim uh, took a temporary leave of absence. Uh, Vanessa, this this is something I know you feel pretty strongly about, um, and you commented, and it's still up on my LinkedIn post, about men that are powerful and women who are afraid um, to speak up because of concern of retaliation or other things. So 
wanted to give you some time to talk about this. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, it's a really difficult subject. Um, very, very difficult. Um, I, um, I'm close to the subject because it happened to me, right? I'm the, one of my uh, board members from uh, my ex-company called Sasha Hausman. I can say his name because I won in court. I can, you know, I, uh, he, he, he put a defamation case against me and I just won last week. So I can say his name <laughs> loud and proud and warn everyone uh, in the industry that this man is dangerous. Uh, his name is Sasha Hausman. And he was uh, my boyfriend, so he was my ex-boyfriend. And he was a board member of my company. And one night he uh, attacked me. And I ended up in hospital and he ended up in a prison cell. Now, I was very lucky, unlike many other victims of domestic violence, which is what it's called, intimate partner violence, is that I, during during this episode of 20 minutes where he beat me up, I managed to take my phone and call the police. And so I had a police recording to show in court. Now, this is the, the issue with, uh, with most attacks of the kind is that we don't have proof. It happens in an intimate sphere, in the intimate sphere. And, and it's one person against the other saying what the truth is. And it's very hard for our judges to decide. Now, I think when, there's something, when something like this happens to you as a, as a woman, um, the reaction that we need to have is, first of all, to believe her. Right? And this is one of the really hard things is when people don't believe you. So one is to believe her, uh, for sure. And secondly, is to is to report it. Now, I was, you know, strong enough because I had somebody on my side, you know, my my current partner who who pushed me to report, who told me, "Don't be scared. Go in front of a judge. Do it." I had somebody like that next to me, but most women don't have that, um, and so they need. They need others like us here, um, maybe the industry, the employer, the friend, the mother, um, <clears throat> people around to help them uh, denounce. And if the person is scared to denounce, then they should denounce, even if it is anonymous. They should denounce because these people are sick. You know, people who do this are very, very sick and they need treatment and they need to be removed from society until they're cured. Right. So um, it's a very it's a very big societal problem. I'm not one to uh, you know I don't have the solutions, obviously, but this is one of the ways that after three years of studying the subject and speaking to very very many women about it, that I find is important is that we need to support as employers as friends, and we need to we need to denounce, we need to tell the police, and we need to believe, right? So do I kind of answer your question? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, um, mm. yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I wanted to get Don's impact as well, but once, so all this stuff was happening uh, first, through Instagram, a video from uh, Instagram, um, which came out, and obviously the victim was extremely emotional, um, and it got forwarded all over the place. And then she created a second video, and, and clearly, and then she published uh, photos from the hospital uh, showing just terrible, terrible mm. assault. Um, mm. uh, so it was terrible. She's very brave. Well, she was, and um, but the thing was, the people that normally uh, are very, very chatty in the U.S. market and are virtue signaling, uh, and I'm talking men, um, nobody um, that I was aware of would would even touch the story, let alone even comment. 
uh, and my LinkedIn post is still up there. So um, then women were contacting me as well, as you could clearly understand, because they were very upset, uh, extremely upset about the whole situation. But they were concerned about retaliation, which you commented about how powerful men um, are mm -hmm. in this industry, even though a lot of the bulk of uh, the employees are women. Um, in, our, in our company, 70% of, of our company is women, but yet the power dynamic is at most C-level positions, it's it's men, and it's the case at V-Trips as well. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, we're trying to be as sensitive as possible. And so they were concerned that if they spoke out, they would get retaliated against. And then other powerful men, for whatever reason, and some of it might be that uh, they had monetary connections uh, with Casago, uh, which is the company where this is alleged to have happened. Um, but they would not come out and, and say anything um, publicly. Mm -hmm. So finally, I published something um, on LinkedIn and it got 15,000 views. And eventually the, um, the victim, um, and obviously I'm not revealing her name because she could decide to go private again. And I don't want to do that. But uh, she said, look, I I'm the woman who finally went public after another victim was brave enough to go public to our abuser's family. It shouldn't have taken me going public for something to actually have been done by the company or our abuser to go on a leave. Everyone close to the abuser knew within two weeks of me having my head bashed in you can't say you are for women and proud of women if you abuse women and then cover for someone else. Going through this has taught me how methodical and evil people are. The ongoing defamation of my word or other women's words only show why women do not come forward with abuse. I appreciate you taking the time to post the right message for me and all the women who have ever experienced domestic violence. Um, Don, um, I'm curious because we haven't talked at all about this, but what did you hear about this and what, what are some of your thoughts uh, as a woman in senior leadership and at the sea level? Well, just like Vanessa, this is difficult, not because I have personal experience with it. Um, I'm lucky that, that I have not, but I can empathize with um, being a woman and having that additional, I'm not going to call it a glass ceiling because that's a cliche, uh, but the you want to advance your career and anything that is counterintuitive to that, like whistleblowing, um, you, it makes you think, do, do I really want to do this? It might give the, you know, the short-term solution, but how is this going to impact me down the road? That's that's terrible that we have to think that way, but it it's it's true. Um, you're you know you weigh the pros and cons of doing something like that, and it shouldn't even it shouldn't even come down to that. Yeah, the trouble uh, is that you then that you then have on your conscience um, the next attack, right? So what happens right. to to this woman? And that, that I think is what happens is before. that when somebody else comes forward, that is that that conscience, what's on your conscience does come back and say, OK, now you have to say something. Yeah. So I think that's why you see mm. more victims come forward as time progresses, because they say, oh, I should have said something. I should have done something. Maybe mm. that could have prevented um, mm -hmm. this from happening. Yeah, it so, also protects you, you know, because as you gain to the public eye, you, you, you're protected by the public eye. You know, I felt like there's no way anybody would let that man do anything to me now. You know, if I go to a conference, I can be, I think I feel safe. Even if he shows up, I feel safe. There will be people there to protect me. And then there's that, is, is that idea that you're protected by the public eye. And another really important thing is that it helps you heal. Talking about it and denouncing helps you heal because I have had women who have been contacting me. They said, it's been 20 years that I have this, 20 years, and I still dream about it every night. They go through really heavy PTSD for years on end because I haven't talked about it. 
you know, everything, everything points to talk about it. And yes, the repercussions are hard. I mean, I, I lost my co-founding CMO job because of it. I invested lots and lots and lots of money in defending myself in a defamation case. I wasn't, I don't know how many next to him again in how many tribunals uh, because of it, how many uh, courts, court, um, how do you say, uh, court rooms, you know, where we fought each other for the last three years. And the repercussions have been really hard. Uh, but I can safely say that I am out of PTSD. I have done the right thing. I have done the right thing because people are way more aware that there's a psychopath uh, amongst us. And, um, you know, he, he didn't even say sorry. <laughs> yeah, the last court case I went to, my lawyer said, if he says sorry now, we have a problem. <laughs> you know, we'll lose. They need to say sorry. They need to admit and they need to say sorry and they need to seek help. And the only way we can do that as victims is by denouncing them. Is the only way. And we need to grab that courage. You know, that courage is anybody's listening now about and is going through this. You need to grab the courage. Grab some people that you love around you and go and denounce it. And yes, it's hard, but it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And you know, most of these attacks end in death. You know, they end in death. Eventually, you end up dead. So it's really, really dangerous to live with people like that. Really dangerous. Um, there you go. Miriam, I, I, I know you um, got quite a lot of information. Uh, obviously, information was shared with me, which this was not the first time that it took um, the victim going public um, with Instagram and then obviously on LinkedIn for others to step up and what happened is other people stepped up um, and in the case of this um, this uh, alleged perpetrator, another woman who um, shares a child with him had documented details of, of domestic assault. I mean, numerous times. Um, and, uh, but I, I guess she was afraid to say something. Uh, Miriam, I'm just asking you because it's just, Odd to me, given the passion you you hear on this episode, why has there been so much silence with the men involved in this? Like, there's clearly the CEO of Casago, Steve Schwab. He stayed silent, hasn't made a public comment. Um, there's other men that have been associated with Casago, who were basically bros or drinking buddies um, that would go out and do things with him. They've been very silent. Um, I, I get that everybody is due, um, you know, their day in, in court, due process, et cetera. But how can you not denounce domestic assault and, and, and basically talk about how important it is that the victim has a voice and shouldn't be afraid because the perpetrator was still working uh, for that company and, and really seemingly there were no consequences until she got enough public support. No, you're right. I think the biggest question is, like you said, it's the bro code. I mean, these people knew in October, but yet we were still at a conference in November and December, and they were all together, all out having a good time, but yet they knew, and no one has said anything. Everybody has, where do you stand? Because I know so a lot of these individuals for 10 plus years, they have daughters. So in my mind, which I'm extremely disappointed in a few of this bro code pact that are C-level members who are in our industry that are top people on boards of different regulations. And is in my mind, and I know a lot of other women that I've spoke to, it seems that they're okay with this because they've not denounced or they've not supported or said anything. But yet, if you look on LinkedIn, they're more than happy to like other stuff or comment. But where are we when this is a huge impact for all of us? It's really just disappointing and heartbreaking from a woman's standpoint, but also knowing some of these individuals for a very long time and sitting back and them not saying anything. 
which I'm sure Dawn and Vanessa, you're impacted by that as well. Most women should be and are. Totally, totally. Um, and the company should do a statement. Mike's company did a statement, at least internally, you know. Um, they need to do a statement and they need to admit that this is a problem and and they need to help as opposed to uh, doing what they're doing right now. They need to help. They need to acknowledge. And But this is a lack of education within companies. Mm -hmm. We have uh, we don't have policies around that. What happens if your coworker, if you notice that your coworker is going through domestic violence? We don't have policies around that, and uh, and and we need them. And there's uh, various groups now of of activists that um, that help companies uh, produce those those processes, how to react as a company, because it also affects the company. Obviously, you know, affects on the on the output of that person as a worker uh, a lot, you know, when you're going through something like this. So um, that needs that needs to change. It needs to be an open discussion. It needs to be an open discussion. And that person in that company needs help, you know, and the, 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 the company should be helping them as opposed to denying it. If I'm the, I'm trying to put myself in the position of a C-level member and this happening in my company, and it is it would be a very hard decision if this was not public it was known and you are seemingly taking care of it internally would you do you go public with it do you um then upset your investors do you upset your your franchise owners do you so i'm just saying that it is it would be difficult to to if you're if you think you're taking care of it of it internally do you go public with it that that's 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 a difficult choice i mean we all think yes there should be a public statement but i can i can understand the hesitation of um I'd like I I'd like to say on that because I tried to convince my ex company that it was the right thing to do and they didn't agree. They didn't agree that going public was the right thing to do. Um, but what I'd like to say about that is that on the contrary, if you show as a company that you take care of your employees, that you stand by them, that you do not accept this type of of violence, that this is wrong, then you stand out as a company for doing the right thing for, in front of investors and in front of everyone. Um, this wasn't the case for my company and to completely rise, probably not the case was, uh, was, was many, but it should be, <laughs> it should be. It's, you know, turning the narrative around. We're not gonna hide something that horrid that's happening and that we know about. We're gonna talk about it and, and turn it into our favor. We are that kind of company that, you know, if you have problems at home, we help. Mm -hmm. Well, I I will say, you know, at Vitrix, we've never had anything quite like this, um, but we have had um, incidences of harassment um, against female employees. And as soon as, um, as I, I'm aware of, and sometimes I've been aware of because people have contacted me directly that, either were victims of the, of the harassment or were knowledgeable of the harassment happening. The first question I wanted, I, I asked them is, can I talk to my HR department about this? Or do you feel comfortable? And if they gave me permission, then, you know, you have a conversation with the HR department and depending on the seriousness of the, of the allegations, uh, you hire an independent um, consultant investigator um you definitely would seriously consider putting someone on leave and we've done that uh, particularly if they're in a position of authority uh and then although you're probably not going to release a public statement you're going to internally <laughs> talk to um, all the employees in that office and and you would definitely issue um an hr follow-up um and in our company we um did also training uh, harassment training mandatory 
uh, different levels for supervisors than employees, but we wanted to make sure everyone was aware of what is harassment. And, um, you know, domestic assault is just even so much bigger than that. Um, you know, we haven't had it, but I, mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine how you would stay silent as a company over this. I mean, we have too many women yeah. we're trying to protect here. I mean, the, and you know why you you you're aware of uh, you know sexual sexual assaults and in, in inside the company is because of the Me Too movement, right? Because these women came forward. Now there are new laws and policies around the U.S. that uh, make sure that if you do assault somebody, uh, you know, at work, there are repercussions. Now we don't have this kind of hashtag in the domestic violence uh, world. Uh, the, the, the conversation is not there, and it's it's a much bigger problem than the Me Too problem uh, because it ends in death. You know, uh, so it's crazy. So we we need to put that conversation forward, and I'm I'm so thankful that you you're doing this, uh, Steve, and and for your LinkedIn post, and to provide support to um, to to our friend who this happened to. On that note, we're in the session okay. of uh, Straight Fire VR. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you again. That wraps another episode of Straight Fire VR podcast. To watch previous podcast. You can go to www.straightfirevr.com. For questions or comments, you can also email us at straightfirevr at gmail.com. As always, you can catch everything on our YouTube channel, Straight Fire VR.